So I'll, I'll start the presentation off by saying that uh, I, don't, I don't believe that there's a silver bullet. We, none of us here have a silver bullet for, for fixing the problem. Uh, I mean, there may be one actual solution to the entire problem, but I don't think it's ready to be activated again uh, to, to fix the problem. So uh, what I'd like to say is that I think that there's cre three critical factors to winning in cyber warfare. And I think that has to do with the capability, the intelligence, and the leadership. Uh, cyber crime is, and cyber warfare is not only a national security issue, it's a national economic issue. Uh, our economy today is largely based on intellectual property, so we, we certainly have a, a lot to lose there. When we talk about capability, I'm talking about um, people, uh, the training, and the equipment. I think we're incredibly fortunate in the United States with the resource pool that we have of people. But I think one of the things that we need to consider focusing on is having the ability, and, and this sounds like a lot what Skip's doing, is having the ability to identify those people that have the aptitude. Because I think we'll all agree here, you can put people through the training, but not everybody's just going to get it. Not everybody's just going to take to this type of skill set. So we need to be able to identify those people with that aptitude and nurture that talent without regard to, to how they fit into the social structure. Uh, I've seen, seen many brilliant people uh, in cyber warfare, cyber crime, college dropouts, high school dropouts. Uh, but, you know, in our government, in our military, uh, it's very difficult for us to fit them into our structure. Bill Gates said in his book, The Road Ahead, uh, he asked the question, how many potential Einsteins has the world lost due to economics? Either somebody didn't go to college or dropped out. Uh, I've also heard of really highly talented people who innovate outside their current career track and are either squashed and uh, uh, subsequently they, they, uh, uh, that innovation is squashed or their ideas are actually taken from them and passed off to someone in the right career track who could never really fully realize the potential of that innovation. And I think that that's something that we really have to look at. Uh, I also think, lastly, with the people, I think we have a, a great challenge in the military and in the federal government, at least, hanging on to those highly talented people. Uh, I, I see in the, the federal government we struggle with career paths and pay, uh, and, and that is that our current career paths force great practitioners, great technicians out of doing what they do best. If they want to provide for their families, uh, earn more money, they must move into management. And and, uh, you know, they're kind of capped. I don't think that you find too many people over the GS-13 level that are allowed not to be in a management role. And I think in the cyberspace, that is a mistake uh, because we will lose them. We're hemorrhaging them now. I think in the civilian agencies, we've got to be able to get them up into the grades of 14 and 15s. And even we have in the equivalent SES pay scale, the SLs and STs to be able to hang on to those talents. And same in the military. Uh, I was talking with uh, uh, Skip and he was saying that they, they were promoting people all the way up through chief master sergeant and, and colonel, I think full bird colonel. So I think that's great. Uh, with respect to intelligence, uh, I, I think we always will need better cyber intelligence. Uh, there are no borders in cyberspace, so we need a global view on what's happening in cyberspace. And I'm, uh, we don't just need a national view. That's what I wanted to stress. In cyberspace, there's, there's no borders, so we have to have that global picture of who's being attacked, who's being probed, who's being infiltrated. Uh, this perhaps where TJ had mentioned the ISPs can, can help. Why is he getting in-mapped? And if he is getting in-mapped or attempts are being uh, made, why can't that ISP uh, be a partner to providing this information, uh, not just stopping it, but also letting us know the intelligence value of here's where it's coming from, or these are the IPs. Let's start start working together to have a better awareness uh, and reporting, particularly within our borders, at, at a bare minimum. Of course, the problem is when you start talking about intelligence, I, I don't feel that there are enough incentives for victims in the private sector to share 
information about their probes, their attacks, uh, their infiltrations. Uh, it's contrary in the pri privacy sector. Uh, if they do tell about their attacks, their compromises, what happens to their stock prices, their public confidence in their company. Uh, so I don't, I don't have the answer, but I do know that we need to somehow consider incentivizing the information sharing uh, from our private sectors. I don't know if that means we have to make it confidential. They can share that attack information and somehow it gets, uh, uh, you know, anonymized or uh, we have to lessen the, or at least not create the liability for the victim and then we also have to protect the privacy of our citizens. Um, we also have to, at the same time, uh, incentivize the appropriate spending by companies uh, because you don't want your company to be spending a million dollars in security, but your competitor is, is spending absolutely nothing on security. So we have to incentivize the uh, private sector to protect themselves appropriately, and then when they do get attacked, uh, get some of that sharing. Um, the national strategy, I think a national strategy that incorporates uh, and incentivizes sharing of threat data across not just government or military, but private sectors, the internet service providers, large businesses, et cetera. I think that's uh, going to be critical. And I'll uh, speed up there. Leadership, command and control. That's, uh, I also want to say uh, in this highly technical field, I love sitting next to, to people like the doctor here because this is, a, this is a guy that grew up as a cyber practitioner. He's not a leader in the Army because he's just a, a darn good soldier and can kill people really fast. He's, he's, a good, he's a leader because how good he is technically. I say that only because he keeps looking at me and I don't want him to. Um, but, but with the leadership question, we have to ask, I think one of the most difficult questions that we're going to have to ask ourselves is uh, how do we uh, combat and defend against the cyber threat? Who is the authority? Who's going to be the lead agency? Cyber crime and cyber warfare, global no borders. Uh, the battlefields that have been defined, you know, land, air, sea, space, well, cyber doesn't have the battle. Oh, thank you.